Um, so our first speaker today, uh, our keynote, um, is Mark Lucas. Um, a little bit of a history on Mark. He was a dis dis di one of the first district agronomists appointed back in Tumut in 1981. Uh, he was first to initiate private consultancy in 1992 uh, oper and operates pasture agronomy services and has done from 1992 to 2021, um, which is an integrated pasture, livestock, fodder and cropping advisory service. Uh, and he, he undertakes 380 soil tests per year through his client base. Uh, so I'll just ask Mark to come forward um, and his talk today is increasing pasture sophistication and management. Uh, welcome everyone, and uh, before I start I'd applaud the uh, LLS and their association with the DPI in putting a pasture-based conference on. I, I've worked in that space for you know, the last you know, 40 years, and I think it's only now that pastures are receiving the due recognition, and hopefully after the presentation you'll see why in fact that is such a worthy statement. Cropping uh, and you know the across cereals and pulses has always been, I think the the crops that attract most of the research. There's a lot of research that is required for long-term sustainability in pastures, and uh, you know there hopefully will be a change um, in, into the future in regard to that. So um, before I, I start, you know the uh, the Griffith Day was a pretty big. Big day, as I said, it was a it was a good crowd and a very diverse crowd. I was the last speaker over there, and I was that bad they put me up front, so you people don't walk out early, I suppose. But uh, over there, and it's just to recount a, a quick story that uh, it was it was a long longer day, so I thought I'd grab a coffee, and I went into McDonald's, and uh, I I thought, well, I'll just grab that, drive back to Wagga. And in the corner, while I was waiting, there was this uh, well-presented woman and a heavily tattooed man that was sitting in, the, in one of the cubicles. And not as though I was trying to overhear uh, anything, but uh, it, it goes like this, that she said, uh, Daryl, help me do the crossword. It was in the paper. And he, and he goes, er, like that. And she said, it's a simple grammar question. What comes at the end of a sentence? And I thought, well, that's probably pretty simple. And his answer to it was parole. So, <laughs> so I, got, I got the answer right, I thought, but he had a better one. And so what I wanted to use that as an illustration that sometimes there's always two levels to a simple question. Uh, right. I'm probably going to uh, run through a lot of information here, and I probably do excuse myself that if there is a few too, a few too many, and it's already started, that I'll get on and um, pretty much l jump over a few and come back to a couple of others. So agriculture in itself, it's, it's complex. If you wanted a more complex business, you couldn't get it. And I think that that statement up there encompasses it. And you uh, people out there, I mean, you've been in agriculture a long time. If you have only just entered it, it is exciting. And it's a space that I see that, you know, Australia has only been truly recognised as a top quality producing nation. And, you know, I've always said to my clients, you're not a farmer. You're a food producer, and you know when you look at what our role is, it's a, an extremely valuable role when you look at the uh, the world as it is today. So everyone knows the good times, and that is the clover, not the girl there. But it's it was a nice picture back in 2015 that we saw, you know, absolutely marvellous. With it's been repeated actually last spring. But far too often we see this uh, picture here, 
And that's what we've got to actually rede redesign our systems. We can do it. Droughts, we know they're coming. They're always going to be part of the Australian agricultural scene. Pastures now are a very expensive uh, program to become established, and we've got to protect them. And we've got to be smart about the, uh, the way we go about that protection model. Media love those two photos. The previous one, they wouldn't give two hoots because you're looking at a city-centric uh, group of people that like to still condemn agriculture. So I'm not interested in droughts. I just call it dry time management because we'll always have more dry time management, dry times than droughts. And as a response to that, you know, we need to be smarter about what we do and we've, become, we've got to become more sophisticated in what we do. So if I was just show of hands out there, how many people actually think that they're being rewarded for their livestock prices at the moment? I don't know, everyone should have their hand up. I mean, we're, we're in a period of high recognition for the value of your efforts. Not in the past 12 months, I think it's recognised it for the last 20 years. We've been a little bit undervalued. And the price of uh, your livestock currently, even if they wobbled a little bit, I think that you can see you can make major investments into your property and the systems that you've got in place to buffer these droughts. So you've got to get a lot smarter if you haven't already started to put in some of those um, areas of insulation, let's call it. Soil, soil moisture retention in your soils, I see that as the greatest understanding. Um, we've got to really look at building higher uh, organic matter levels, uh, which the whole thing revolves around surface cover, humus, et cetera, et cetera. So when you've got moisture, it stays with you, it doesn't run off. And that's a very individualised uh, ac acceptance. You've got to look at your soil. Uh, so how many people out there would be soil testing annually? Uh, I would say not a great response. And really relative to the new land values, uh, if you look at you know, what's happened to your property, you're all millionaires times many. So those land values aren't going to slide back. I think we really need to know our businesses are based on soil and understanding it. You're the interface of pasture management over the top of that soil. Uh, water, everyone would understand that the better it is, the better everything is. And you know, f further to that, we've never got enough time to do things as well as we should. Uh, modern agriculture consumes so much time that you know we end up, you've got a lot of paperwork that you've got to do, you get audited, it all takes time. And I look at that statement of being time poor, we've got to actually look at ways and means about still farming and maintaining that, that balance that you're not stressed in doing what you're doing. Uh, weather patterns. I think we've got a lot of information. A lot of it's still uh, not as good as it should be, but you know, a farmer ha needs to make his own interpretation on what the weather is, and you're going to pull it from many sources. So, with this, my uh, my company, uh, Pasture Agronomy Service, I've been blessed to work with the people in the top, you know, one third of farmers, the people that always want to be in here. They're people that will early adopt and they're people that actually don't mind a couple of failures. If they try something, it doesn't work, they'll redefine it and make it work. And I see the LLS, unfortunately, there's a few fellas down in this back area that it's, it's a tough gig trying to ask or put solutions in front of them to, to become more resilient and a, a better agricultural outcome. So that's, uh, I think, an extremely good 
uh, graph that you've got to maintain the people that are at the top end of that spectrum are better influences to the people at the bottom than so, uh, someone like a consultant or even a DPI person. Uh, you look at the world, it's not going backwards in numbers. They talk about farmers having their stocking rate right, but uh, globally there's no one with their foot on anyone at the moment. But th they're pretty accurate figures, and that's why I said you're not farmers, you're food producers, and the value of those red meats, and I've restricted this to pastures, so red meat is uh, beef and sheep there, and importantly, you look at the major destinations, and oops, sorry. Obviously, I'm going the wrong way. My apologies. Right. So you look at the um, the the amount of product that's produced from beef, sheep, and wool actually is a higher level than what grain is, and it's not recognised because pastures aren't sexy. You don't see too many people uh, quoting, you know, a high tonnage or a high stocking rate or a high production of beef or sheep per hectare, but you'll see it with the, uh, I suppose, the nice smiling photo in paper with a 10 tonne wheat crop, for sure. But let's, let's say they've been understood a long time, that is, pastures, and the role they serve and the value they're going to deliver into the future is significantly more important. Um, so what I wanted to say here is in the past, and when I've been in a, in a position of servicing pastures primarily, <clears throat> in, we've always looked at maximising things, maximum crop, uh, maximum crop yield, maximum everything. And I think there's now a new mindset that of today that we're looking at being profitable and the word sustainable, it fits across a very, very large area, but there's no doubt in the wide world that that's what we've got to be because you know it takes a long time to build soil. We've got to maintain it and improve on it to be in business, uh, not only for your generations, but for thousands of years into the future. So I just wanted to quickly uh, go back to where we were, because sometimes the best place to be uh, to find out what we've achieved is to reflect in the past to know where we're going in the future. So in the 80s, there was a lot of under, and let's, let's call these paddocks to the east, there was, and in the, in the, through the tablelands, there was a lot of low stocking rate, um, and even at low stocking rates, animal health issues existed. Um, they had a big run of positive seasons through the 80s. And the biggest and most striking was the fact that Roundup entered the marketplace, because the only knockdown herbicide prior to that was Gramoxone, which, uh, as you're well aware, it made things yellow, but main, mainly uh, was unsuccessful in killing anything perennial or uh, led to successful um, establishments. So when Roundup came out in uh, 1982, on that front, it cost around 48 to $49 a litre. And when you look at it today, it, you can buy Roundup on average for about <coughs> four, $4 a litre. So it's a tenth the price. But back then, also farmers' incomes were pretty modest to low. So getting someone to put Roundup on, they'd always be wanting to go to the lowest figure. Because at $50 a hectare back then, was a big investment. So times have changed. Uh, we also had ex exceptional research into Patterson's Curse and the fact that uh, anyone that knows Gundagai was famous for Patterson's Curse. And just with the addition of a little bit of Igran, 
uh, with your MCPO 24D, we we nailed that one. So you know it's now the technology. What I'm saying, greatest levels of sophistication, because most graziers would not have owned a boom spray either at that point. Uh, soil testing focus was primarily on phosphorus, and in the 80s, uh, in collaboration, I think the DPI of Victoria and New South Wales had paired paddocks, just trying to get more production from getting phosphorus levels corrected, and tetraploid ryegrass for higher rainfall country. And that's an illustration right next to it. You know, it's a very, very lush, large leafed winter active ryegrass with brilliant quality. And, you know, livestock performance probably trebled on it compared to a, a native or not native or just a slightly improved fertilised pasture. And then red legged earth mite accounted for 64 per cent of pasture failure. And we came up with some reasonably good residual insecticides and we went from failure to 95 per cent success. And you know, still today, it's part of the package that we used. Because I found that farmer eyesight back in the 80s, you know, it wasn't that good. And you'd ask the question, have you basically been across that paddock to see whether you've got red-legged earth mite? They say yes, they weren't fibbing, but they couldn't see them because they're pretty small. Uh, and salinity was on everyone's lips. 90s, we'll just run through the expansion of direct drilling is the most significant breakthrough in successful pasture management. We didn't have to cultivate and we ended up with success. Every time we, we programmed a, uh, an area of development, it would work. So that was the greatest breakthrough which led to those magnificent pasture productivity increases. And you know, you've then got farmers that were growing surplus feed and we needed to buy more animals. So the progression has been, uh, I, I think, slow, but it's always been positive. And I, I've also added there biological control and the breakthrough with Patterson's Curse having a bug to control it uh, was absolutely first class and that they were released all through Tarkata, up to Gundagai, those areas. And in nine, nine years out of 10, they worked marvellously well. And the Blackberry one didn't work that well, did it? No. So here we are, we, went, we move into 2000s to 20s, and we end up with a whole heap of droughts and machinery sophistication started you know, air seeders, that's a, um, a, a five metre tag drill compared to your little shearer or conichet drills that used to be. And uh, we, we're getting better results with these and those farmers aren't sitting on tractors as long uh, because they've been able to up it. Also, the manufacturers have done a lot of research in that, that space. Uh, the great, the other great uh, fortune that happened is that feedlots didn't require animals to be fat or achieve a fat level. They just wanted weight. They wanted growth. And that assisted pro farmer profits because you, you can easily grow an animal to weight on good quality pasture. And if they pay you a premium to do that, it was a big breakthrough for you know farmers, particularly in southern New South Wales, where we've got winter active subclover rye grasses, phalaris, et cetera, and bang, bang, we're, uh, we were making money. And plant breeding, there was also starting to see a little bit of farmer interpretation where you can go over the top. And I make the comment, there's a couple of, of those tetraploid rye grasses that they bred them for such high quality, they may suit a dairy farm, but they weren't under irrigation, but they weren't suiting beef farms and they were just too leafy, you'd get a 35 degree day in October and they'd collapse. So you can go over the top with selection in not only livestock in, in growth performance and other, but you can do it with plants and you've then got to basically go back and breed something that's more adapted 
to the, cli the climate you're in. And if we're, let's say, there's some degree of climate change discussion, if we're going to have a few more hotter days, we don't want plants that just wilt for no reason. So red-legged earth mite, resistant subclover, has been a great breakthrough. The breeding programs in Western Australia are particularly uh, important for eastern states. And many of the mixes that are in the marketplace and used successfully uh, to, to be adopted at farmer level. And I'll just uh, skip through spinnaker, anyone that grows loose and it's got burrs, Bathurst burr, that is a nightmare. There's one chemical that came out that took that control under its wing and now we can grow, bring it loose and without burrs. Aerial agriculture, for all those reasons, herbicide fertiliser and into the future lime uh, took off. And anyone that's seen how that su supply area of, they've adapted, they're run by um, very, very, to run a helicopter, you've got to be a smart person. And they then have adapted that they fly onto that truck, they suck the water out of it. They didn't want farmers, you know, coming down there with their little firefighters and trying to fill them up. They said, you bring the water to that truck, you put it in the truck, we'll suck it out. And they've improved their efficiency of, you know, downtime down to one third of what it was, you know, two to three years ago when they were relying on water <coughs> supplied from uh, farming units. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, but uh, under PAS clients, we've got matrix farming, which is in simple terms, a practical three year rotation where we, we know within 80%, 90% of what we're going to be doing in three years time. And we have the relative improvement uh, programs in place during that period of time. It's it's just a matter of being uh, a little bit intelligent about management and pre-planning is the key to that effect. Interestingly, uh, there's a, a lot of debate at the moment with which grazing system. We use all methods when we need to and how we need to apply them in various areas. That's how we get about it rather than just being uh, married to one type of um, grazing technology. So uh, the, the greatest thing that I see is matrix farming is that we understand the native grass that grows, probably confining my remarks, to the east of the highway where we have got summer active grasses, native grasses, and before we, don't, we used to look at them as being, well, we can do something better, but now we've actually said, no, we can work with them and make them a useful part of our you know, summer protein production. So those bits and pieces there, you can read that. Feral animals, you know, it's, it's a big issue. If you've got a heap of national park and you've got pine tree plantations next to a, far, a, a grazing property, I can tell you that they can eat a significant amount of grass you grow. And we, we've not resolved how best to, to control that. Exclusion fencing is part of it, but the animals are still on the other side of the fence breeding up. They'll always want to get back onto fertilised, improved pasture. So that, there's a solution that you guys can <laughs> start working on. Uh, pastures of no value unless consumed by an animal. And they haven't. You can grow the most magnificent pasture but unless you manage to put it through an animal, it's, it's actually not going to end up in your bank balance. So going through that, the, what I wanted to bring up here is the media. They love to bash agriculture up, and as a consequence to that, they've got a very sympathetic city base. So I'd like to see our representational bodies really start to get a better machine that promotes the good, the good, not the ugly, that, uh, that agriculture has done over the period of time and do it significantly better. As 
a very, very high note uh, American professor said, he said, we need to involve more people in agriculture and it should start at school level. And everyone heard that and they didn't know what it, he said, you give a child or a student a pea seed and they'll be engaged in agriculture. So if you put it, that pea seed on a bit of cotton wool, you know, that kid will go, as long as it doesn't swallow it, I suppose, um, that that kid will go home and will make some observations on its germination and its development. And it's a smart, very simple and effective way. So out of uh, this slide, we've got those politicians running the world. And, you know, it is a, a very, very unsettling period of time. We've got uh, African swine flu, uh, which is impacting on our profitability because China is going, going through phase two and three of it. They're not telling us the numbers, but they're, they're significantly back in a lot of problem trying to control that as their major protein in pork. It's a big a step up for Australia. So I'm going to um, skip over a couple of these things, but soil testing into the future, it won't be just basic soil testing. We'll be looking at the level of understanding with biological activity within your soil, and that's you know your your bacteria, your your hyphae, your microbial, all that fraction. We need to understand it because it's what drives the soil. And if anyone wants to write down Dr. Elaine Ingram's uh, name there, get on and have a look at what that lady has developed in terms of that understanding that soil food web. Uh, it's an amazing ride. So let's, uh, let's just quickly go back. Who's prepared for the next drought? Is, can I, can everyone put the hand up that you're all ready for it? We know it's going to come, but often we haven't changed enough to, to be in a better spot. We don't need to be primarily saying, oh, hell, you know, here we go and look for another government handout. I think the government's probably going to be scraping the barrel to give freight, uh, you know, rebates on fodder into the future. They're, they're a little bit wiped out with this pandemic. And, you know, the, um, it's, it's just a matter that you've got to be looking more positively with a greater level of sophistication at your own business. There's a typical paddock. We look at pastures once every three, uh, five years. Uh, the recommendation is to only half graze that paddock through spring and let it fully recruit. And that photo there demonstrates really the, um, the, the level of reseeding, and that brings a big level of crown expansion, a significant increase in root structure and size, and again, funny enough, it will grow better in a drought. The, the, um, the, the other things that I've got there is knowledge is power. You've got to see your knowledge base and you've got to be confident in it. And there's more and more uh, people out there that can, and businesses that can supply objective data and business advice than what there was 30 years ago. Uh, fertiliser, I just wanted to bring that up. A big breakthrough in cold country is for us to be putting on low levels of urea in autumn. And we've basically doubled our dry matter production through winter by bolstering our nitrogen level in that soil once we've got a full germination. The rates may only be 50 and 60 kilograms of urea, uh, but the net effect on that plant's performance in the dead of win winter is quite amazing. Water, water, quality, quality. That's all I can say. We've got to make better dams. Everyone's got better reticulation schemes in and livestock respond to it. And, you know, there's too many areas out there that people always blame some disease, but it, it'll be something the animal's subject to. And you look at its immune system and you'll be hearing more from Gordon Rafshawki about those sorts of things going on into the future. Um, those 
pasture species that I've got there, the, uh, the PAS clients, we've tended to go to proven blends. Uh, the perennial blends still encapsulate the recent more up-to-date clover varieties, the winter active phalaruses, and we are probably producing double of what we were 20 years ago on a, a hectare basis. You look at technology, there's the drill, it's a, a 511 converted. There's a drill uh, that yeah, does cost a bit, but that's a seraphim there that, you know, we're sowing pastures, single disc placement is, is exceptional and we're getting probably of the seed we sow somewhere in the vicinity of 90% of the seed up. So seed placement's improved and it's, we've gained from it. So the um, whole area of uh, soil acidity, you'll be hearing more about that, but until we can get or prevent soil acidity that's occurring in non-trafficable country or hill country, we can't call ourselves sustainable. And uh, Helen Burns, will, she's down in the audience there, she'll be able to help us come up with some solutions with that. But 40% of the country that I serve is hill country, and it's actually still acidifying backwards, but all the research has been done on country that you can get a lime spreader over. I'll leave it there. Um, just a couple of soil targets. Don't be afraid to use some, or some composts out of feedlots on tough country that's, that's for one reason won't establish that well uh, to your, um, your current fertiliser regimes. Often putting a, a, a compost out of one of the feedlots or a chook shed works marvellously well. And it's not just new nutrient related, it's what it does to the soil biota. It's the bugs responding to it, building that soil. So those last few things there, I'm looking at sophistication, that creep feeder, a lot of people are using those now during periods of time when the pasture is deficient, they only want to feed the calf or the lamb. And where there's many people have looked at what used to be a dairy farmer's dream. They've invested in feed mixes, again, using products that are on farm, but reducing wastage. And they're chopping it up, gaining more advantage and using a nutritionist to make sure that what they do. So pastures are the, the forgotten heroes of agriculture. And as I said previously, it's wonderful to be involved in the uh, revitalization of that. Um, we ha have got a skill set shortage in agriculture that needs to be addressed. And we won't do it here, but that needs to go back to many of the people up the chain. We need more graduates at all levels across agriculture, because the better it gets, the more people will want to come to it and they need to be skilled to do it. So that's primarily the uh, final slide that I want to finish off with, is that we, we want a, a world that we're using less herbicide, less insecticide, and we'll be looking at biological controls. And only last night, Gordon Rafshawgi assured me that the work on Bathurst Burr control biologically is in place and hopefully in that space you'll be putting a little bit of uh, fungicide out rather than spending thousands, tens of thousands of dollars and time trying to control that mongrel weed. He thought he was pretty, pretty smart. He called it uh, BB. Where is Gordon? He's not here. Justin Bieber, he called it, BB. You don't laugh at that, because I couldn't get it when he said it. But it's a great breakthrough, and if we can do it for other weeds, such as heliotrope, you know, that's where I think that some of our dollars should go. Anyway, thank you for your time. Um, I don't know whether I'm a little over time, but 
We're not too far away from it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, something I took out of your talk there, Mark, is that uh, the one thing that's certain to happen in agriculture is change. And you know, I've been in the industry for 25 years, and it's been constant change in that time. And I think change is getting faster. It's exciting times, I think, in agriculture. And um, so uh, for those young guys in the crowd, I think we have somewhere around 20 TAFE students sitting here somewhere. Um, it's good to see you here. Um, it's an exciting time for you guys to get into agriculture and get those skills behind you because the future is very bright. Um, one of the, uh, the tasks or the, the goals of today was to demonstrate how local land services and DPI can work collaborative together um, to, to deliver value for you guys, our clients. And um, we really appreciate the support that we've got from DPI um, yesterday and today. So um, we've got a number of speakers from their ranks, um, and the first one of those is Richard Hayes.